There we go. <sighs> okay. We are going live on the phone. Okay. So, um, let's see. Everybody, we came back in because I am sick of this thing going in and out. Um, and so we are coming back in this way. Okay. Um, because I really want you guys to be able to get this because it's really good. I want you guys to be able to hear what my husband is saying. Um, so here we are back in. Everybody come on back in. Come on back in with me. Share it again. Share it with your friends, please. Um, because we want to be able to get the full scope of what he is saying. Um, let's see. All right, so we were talking about you, what we were talking about, about that you um, getting out of the military, okay. right? We're talking about you getting out of the military. So now what I want you to kind of talk to everybody about, I want you to talk to us about you being a politician. Mm. Um, the reality that you are now a politician. I want you to tell us... Um, you know, what made, what made you, was it God dropped me and you said, Hey, be a politician. Mm -hmm. Or was it just something that you were like one day, you know, I really feel like this is something that I want to do. Tell us, um, about how you came to want the desire to want to be a politician. Um, so So when we decided to move the Fayetteville to launch our ministry, right? I had no idea what I would do once we got here. Okay. We knew we were going to do ministry, um, but I did not, in my mind, think that I was simply going to be at church every day, sitting around waiting on people. <laughs> what do you mean by sitting around <laughs> waiting on people? You know, people said they're in full-time ministry and they go to church and sit around waiting on people to come in okay. when the ministry is outside of the four walls. Mm -hmm. um, being that we're a very active ministry that's a part of Force Life International's mantra that we are a community church we go outside, we do stuff in the community um, I knew that we would be doing those kinds of things Right. Uh, however, I didn't you know, I knew that wasn't it there was something else here so, first couple of years two years, we did conferences, men conferences Bishop Taylor right. would come up and we started feeding the homeless, we started doing big events yep. um, down on Main Lane Okay. AIT building. And this is this is you evolving into evolving. thinking yeah, about. Yeah, what we thought we started doing. I started uh, doing a little bit of Brittles 3. So I started coaching a little bit of football. Okay. Getting into the community. It's kind of therapeutic, you know. Unwinding from the military. Um, coming to the conclusion that I'm not going to go overseas and be a contractor. That I'm going to oh. stay here in Fayetteville because, of course, um, knew some friends. Mr. Camp, Dr. Camps, Pastor Camps. Okay. Who was a... Who was, um, project manager or program manager had some opportunities um but um it wasn't about money and god let me know um and i'm gonna tell you i have to be honest anything i've ever asked god for for and he knew my heart i've gotten okay there are certain things that i want in my life i'd say god i love you but i if possible i need these certain things so that i can do what you want me to do please and some of it I just asked God for because I, I wanted it. And, but it is amazing that God would let you have your heart's desire. Yes, because what does the word say? That when your ways please him, you'll give you your heart's desire. So do you feel like the things that you ask for definitely please his heart? And that's why he gave you those things? I'm sure. I hope. I, that's my hope and prayer. Um, but I knew I decided. All right, okay, so moving here was not my plan. Okay. Um, that was your plan. Um, that was not my plan. Okay. Um, that's what you had in mind to do. I did not. I never, um, guys, I, I never wanted to, to move, move back floor. here. Bishop T no. said, what do y'all see yourself doing? I'm thinking we moving to Pensacola, Destin, Fort Walton Beach, to deep sea fish and reach souls down on the beach. People need Jesus down there. My wife's going to say something about going to Fayetteville at some point. And when she put it in the atmosphere... My continents fail <laughs> because 
I had been here a little bit in the military. I was like, I'm not coming back to Fayetteville. So, first of all, oh, y'all, my not. plan was not for to come back to Fayetteville. Listen, if your wife can pray, don't let her pray. Because she's going to pray to God and stuff going to happen. Really? <laughs> Y'all, my plan was not, that was not a plan. I didn't have like this plan and say, hey, we going to Fayetteville, North Carolina. I mean, Bishop Tate asked us what, and I just said it, and it just came out. It just came out, and I, my food would die. So, I can't no so let me ask you this question. How do you feel now about it? This is exactly what God wanted us to do. God's grace is yay and amen over our lives. Um, so even up to the point we were moving, I wasn't happy. But listen to this. And it wasn't that I wasn't happy. I was like, come on, God, please. You know, you know how you're going with what God says, but you're like, come on, God, if it's possible, if it's possible, let the cup pass. And so then we started doing Bible study every Wednesday while I was still on active duty and the church was still in Columbia. We would drive two and a half hours one way to do Bible study at a rec center with some nights with nobody in there. And then we would drive back. And then we would just drive back. Right. And she would go to work and now we'll go to work. So wait, so you can't tell all of this because this is another show. Oh, okay, sorry. Well, I won't that's tell you no that, more. Yeah, that. don't tell about that because okay. that's another show. All right, I won't tell you. Yo, but stay on task. What am I supposed to be talking You're about? You're supposed to be talking about the coming to fruition, the manifestation of you being a politician. Yes. So after a year or two of being here, I was blessed to run into a lady called the a man called the bicycle man and the bicycle woman here. They give away free bicycles to children every Christmas. And I started volunteering with them. She asked me to be a part of her board of directors. That's how I met a gentleman by the name of William Leon Crisp. Okay. Bill Crisp. Mr. Crisp is, in my opinion, one of the most life-changing personalities and figures you'll ever meet. You know how you have those gatekeepers that you know God sends? That's what he was. Okay. So you met him there at the bicycle shop, the uh, giving away bicycles. Oh, but I missed something. Okay. I met Mayor Nat Robertson. Okay. Who came to our men's conference in Hope Mills. He did. He did. I remember Out that. of the blue, I'm like, so who is the short? I met him once or twice and I gave him an invitation. I think we sent an invitation to City Hall. In one way, we gave it to him. Yeah. And he came. And the mayor came. Okay. And I was like, oh my God. Okay. The mayor's here. And so, what did that do? That gave me a deeper appreciation for politicians. For politicians, because he took the time to come. Yes, and you know, after that, we all became close friends. Okay, with, yes. With, with Mayor Nat. Um, mm -hmm. He would see Britain and pick Brit up, like, this Uncle Nat. I mean, right, like, right. We're, we came, we're friends now. We became close friends. Right. And that gave me that, like, oh, that wow. different, yes, perception of what politicians are. They aren't right. high-minded. Mm -hmm. um, he came and had dinner, enjoyed the time. And then I met my councilman. Okay, Chris, you met Mr. Bill Chris. Crisp. And what did that do? How? What? What was that like? That shaped you wanting to be a politician? Please tell our viewers. Um, the first thing um, was that I asked them about politics, and I asked. He asked me who I was. Told me a little bit about myself, and I asked him about politics. And he didn't tell me. He didn't give me an answer. I said I was thinking about what the political arena is like. Okay. I'm a retired military officer. I have this time. I have a desire to serve. I am pastoring. Um, but I want to get more information on what being a councilman or a commissioner is like. And he asked me about my family. He asked me about you. Okay. About my kids. Was I going to PTSD therapy at the VA? Okay. Was I taking advantage of my VA benefits? Was I doing the things... Because I told him that I've been where I've been in the military, what had happened to me. So his focus was on how was I as a person, mm. not being a politician. I'm about to cry. So for a year, I would chase him down and try to catch him and talk to him. And he would only ask me about you and the kids in our church. He never talked politics. He wouldn't even broker the conversation. He wouldn't even entertain wow. my desire to be a politician. Mm. And um, so I got a little aggravated for a while, but I was like, okay, whatever, God. <laughs> Because ministry was picking up and we we're doing other things. And it took three years for us to have that discussion. Two years. And he said, well, listen, if you're serious about this political thing, you need to get involved in other things. Because servitude, and you know this as a pastor, serving is not about serving where you want to serve. It's about serving where the service is needed. Where the service is needed. So 
And I'd already started coaching a little league football. It was like 3 4. Remember YMCA when him right. and Thomas and AJ okay. didn't want the same team. Mm -hmm. And then I started um, applying for commissions, boards. He said, get in, learn about the city. Okay. And he said, if you're going to serve people, learn about the people. Okay. It's not smart to say you want to serve people without ever taking the time to learn about who you're going to serve. Now let me interject this. Okay. This is a politician telling you that if you want to that if you want to do stuff like this that you need to learn about people and learn about serving people. Does that re does that not only relate to politicians but and that does that relate to ministry as well? No, it, well, and that's what's so amazing. Um then our conversation took a different shape because he knew I was a pastor. And so now our conversations aren't about serving people. They're about how to serve people better. That's good. Because now you've got two servants talking about service. Mm -hmm. And that's where, our, that's where our relationship went deeper. It turned, into, it turned from a young guy trying to learn from an old guy uh, to a mentor-mentee. And actually, he said it. He said, I'm learning from you like you're learning from me. Mm -hmm. Because you're a pastor. Like you pastor a church. You pastor people. And if you can pastor people in church, you can deal with politics. Okay. Because, um, you know, he was an elder in the church, the Presbyterian church. Mm -hmm. And he says the thing pastors go through, you know, um, they said things this pastor went through. Right. Um, he said, I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. But he was encouraging me to get the experience you need. Mm -hmm. But our conversations were about serving people. Serving people. Yeah, about answering to people, being willing to submit. Because serving and leading is about submitting to the needs of those who follow you. And so that's not just in passion, but that's in politics too. Yes. Okay. So um, it's about eight twenty, and I don't, and I, and we have about ten more minutes. Okay. Um. So I want to ask you, um, a couple of questions. How do you separate the husband? The what you laughing for? Gary Huggins says, "Stay focused, Chris." He know I got ADHD too. Yes, my husband has ADHD, y'all. But anyway, um, so how do you separate the husband, the father, mm -hmm. the pastor, the politician, and the soldier? Mm -hmm. Because there's still a part of you that's the soldier is in there. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give someone that has so many different roles in their life as you do? And when they come to the reality of I'm a husband, I'm a, I'm a father. I'm a pastor, I'm a soldier, I'm a politician, I'm a teacher, I'm a whatever, all these different things. What advice would you give people on how to separate those different roles mm -hmm. when you come to the reality that you will have a, a bunch of roles? Mm -hmm. Okay, first I'm going to say, realize that none of that matters. None of what matters? None of those roles or titles matter. Okay. Um, if you aren't aware that you need Christ and you need your spouse or someone to help keep you self-aware. Okay. So to help keep you self-aware? Mm -hmm. oh. Self to help your help maintain your self-awareness. To help maintain your self-aware. Mm -hmm. Okay. My wife will be quick to say, I ain't one of your soldiers. Okay. <laughs> when I get to call them orders. Well soldiers, you don't really call orders. No, no, just the, the way, way I get to you, you know, operate. The way I operate. In something. Um, she reminds me that this but, is not the army. We are in the army of the Lord together. This ain't the Davis army. This is the Lord's army. Okay. So um, having someone who can look you in the face out of love, they remind you um, of when you need to shift gears. Mm -hmm. But I've learned um, that it's not really about, I don't know, I don't, I don't like to call it putting on hats and taking off hats. No. I'll call it. Um, being able to understand what's needed in the moment. Okay. And I'm still working at being better at that, especially with kids and your wife. Knowing when to gauge, okay, you don't need to give answers, you need to listen. Mm -hmm. And that's something all husbands and wives have to work through. A husband's probably more than wives. Um, so juggling, I won't say juggling roles, but being a multifaceted personality, someone who operates in so many different arenas, um, you have to stay focused, prayerfully focused. So that you're consistent with certain things. Always be truthful. Always be patient. Always be kind. No matter what arena you're in. Always be thoughtful. Always be cognizant that your actions impact other people. So whether you're wearing a hat as a politician or as a pastor or as a husband, make sure that you understand that your actions affect people. Okay. Um, your words affect people. Mm -hmm. And as far as 
multitasking, doing okay. different things. And how do you separate? Like, what are you? How do you oh. separate that? Because decompression, time. Decompression. So I'm gonna just tell this real quick story because I told my husband about this, and then and I mean, you know, he does it too. But I can remember my dad was in the military. My dad was in the military for like thirty five, thirty two, thirty three, yep. thirty four, thirty five. So a lot of years. It was a lot of years, and he was a command sergeant major. Mm -hmm. And so I can remember never having to move and go to different countries or different states. We were always here, but I do remember. Um, that, um, and so I learned with my husband because he is a pastor, he is a city councilman, he's a dad, he's a, all these different things, a husband, coach, a coach. Yes. Um, I learned from seeing what my dad did, how to treat him as far as decompression. Mm -hmm. So my dad would come home from work. He'd come in the door, he'd sit down, he'd take his boots off. And then he'd take his boots and put them in the garage and he would sit at a certain spot on the couch and sit and he would just sit back and watch the news. Now, I watched him watch the news. Sometimes he was watching and sometimes I could tell his mind was elsewhere. Like he was just looking through the TV, but that was his time to decompress. And so I knew that and my mom knew that. So when he came home and he did that, I didn't ask a whole bunch of questions. I didn't ask, was you ready to eat? I didn't ask nothing. My mom didn't. We just knew that this was his time. After he had that decompression time, he would get up, go upstairs, go take a shower, and then he would come back down. He'd sit again for a minute. And then I, my mom or, my, or myself might say, hey, dad, you know, are you ready to eat? And he'd be like, yeah. So decompression is really definitely an important part in how you separate Husband, father, pastor, politician mm -hmm. is what you're saying. Yes. You have to have time and space to transition emotionally from situation mm -hmm. to situation. Especially when there's supercharged situation. When That's you're dealing good. with people's lives or you're dealing with um, weighty topics or you're dealing with um, involved situations that require your energy, your effort, your concentration. It drains you sometimes. And coming home from a stressful day, and then having the kids full of energy just jumping all over you um, it can be almost overwhelming. So um, I really appreciate the fact that not just me, hopefully we give you time. You know, like like as a pastor, when you when, when you minister and you and your God used you and you're tired and you come home, we try to give each other space to kind of, you know, work through whatever it is. And you need that time. Decompression is the most important thing we have to time we have to give each other we have to give each other time to like even you coming home from school sometimes you may sit in the car for 10 minutes and just breathe you know and i remember sometimes you used to, i used to come home and i just kind of lay on the bed and be like and you used to be like what you just at, at school and i'm like but you do not understand how mentally draining it is until i went to that high school <laughs> Mentally draining it oh is my goodness. to deal with kids all day, every high school day, kids high school day. kids, adults almost. Yes, that some of them don't have mothers, fathers. Some of them don't have that, and you gotta, you gotta be there. Yes. Some mothers, some fathers. You gotta leave school to go get kids clothes, shoes. Sometimes just because that's the type of person that you are, you talking to kids. Kids cuss you out, or kids in your, you know, get upset. And so he used to did not understand like. It's not an easy job. It's not like I'm just going there and I'm just sitting there in the office all day or looking around. Like, I'm actually walking around. I'm actually dealing with people. I'm dealing with teachers. I'm dealing with parents. And so that is one thing that he learned as well when we're talking about um, decompressing. So that's how you separate is what you're saying. That's all you, okay. you got to give your spouse time and space to transition from thing to thing, from situation to situation. Okay. You got to. So we got about... Five minutes. Okay. So, next question. What advice... Um, well, you've already kind of given us an advice as a father, pastor, mm -hmm. husband, and different things. Um, but I really want to touch on this because I think it's important. Um, we know that everything that's going on in our society mm -hmm. right now with injustice, with no peace, mm -hmm. and um, you know, Black Lives Matter, and all these different things. And so it is a big topic because we have sons. And we had to sit our sons down and talk to them, our 10-year-old. And we showed him a picture of what happened to George Floyd. We, we kind of asked him questions. What would he do if he was in a situation? with one of his friends at school and he was doing something, you know, 
that's not right to one of his friends and somebody told him to stop would you stop and he said yes and i said if you didn't what would happen he was like well the person might get really hurt i said if they did what would happen to you he was like i'd go to jail and i was like would that be right he was like i, I would have to get in trouble so he understood the concept and then us telling him what happened he actually cried our 10 year old cried because he was just like you know oh my gosh so um real quick give us some advice as a black man what is some advice or encouragement that you would give black men or just our community, our men, and just everybody right now for everything that is going on? What is encouragement that you would give everyone right now? Wow. Um, I, I would tell you what I tell myself. Don't get caught running down the rabbit hole all day. Okay. We can be so invested, if we're not careful, into the emotion of the moment and that we don't ever produce solutions. Mm -hmm. If you want change, then you've got to be the change. If you want change, then you've got to truly affect change. Um, at some point, the yelling, the screaming, the emotional roller coaster that stirs people up, it becomes fruitless. And so you have to find out how to change the things that causes the issues that we're upset about. And these are big issues sometimes. Sometimes these issues aren't about um, sy systems. They're about the fallen state of man's heart. Mm. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I, I do a lot of research. My wife will tell you I'm always talking on my <laughs> soapbox about these topics. Um, but, but prejudice and bias exist in any, every country where there's a majority population and a minority population. Um, and we have a, a more traumatic history. Um, but let's not simply focus on history. Let's focus on the present and how to make a more perfect union, a future. So how can we use that energy? How can we harness that energy to produce change in the world that we want to hand off to our kids? Mm -hmm. Seeing my son cry made me realize I got to change the world that I'm handing off to him. I got to try. I can't simply settle for yelling, screaming, looting, being upset, mad. At the end of the protest, there needs to be proactive energy that changes areas that we don't like. Like a person who's sick, who's sick because they're obese or because their eating habits are wrong, you have to make a decision that if you want to live a better life, you have to change how you live that life. And so we've got to change the areas that need to be changed. I tell people that use that energy. Ball it up, harness it, and use it for positive change. And change is what we need. We need people to reach across and not operate in fear. That's the other word. People are afraid. Um, even being in politics in our city, it's almost 50-50%. People are afraid um, to say something, um, to show empathy, because they're afraid it's not going to be accepted, or they're, gonna, they're afraid that it will be looked at sarcastically. And some people are afraid to voice their anger over it because they're afraid they're going to be uh, ostracized by people who maybe don't feel the same way. So we have to evict fear, kick fear out. We've got to have hard conversations with your children. Charity starts at home. So we got to have these conversations that we have with our kids at home about the kind of citizen, the kind of person they want to be and how we got to showcase Christ through areas of our natural lives outside of Sunday. Right. So I'm telling everyone, um, um, deal with what you have to deal with you personally. Don't give up. Don't simply settle for knee-jerk impulses. And we all have them. I delete four or five Facebook posts today. <laughs> we all do. Okay? Because if we respond to everything that comes up, we'll only be negative. Also, I finally want to say this. Um, a little political spiel. Okay? Um, we cannot allow our nation to be ruled by the extremes, the extreme ends. Um, out of 100% of our nation, there are 20% on the left side of the spectrum that are irate, crazy, they yell all the time, they get all the attention. 20% on the right, they get the same amount of attention. We must be led by the sound-minded, um, conscious-minded, faith-based middle of the nation. Those of us who are in the middle who understand that we've got to move forward. At the end of the emotion, how do you heal hearts through Jesus Christ? How do you heal hearts? through policies, and you move us forward, address the issue, and keep moving forward. And I think that's what we've got to insert, inject 
into every arena of life as never before. Go outside of yourself to be a bridge so that you can bring people together who might not look like you, who is looking for a way to unite to fix the problems that we have in our right. lives. And you said something. You said be a bridge. Um, last week, um, the women and I at Force of Life Favor, we were in prayer. And one of the um, phrases that God kept giving me was bridging the gap. Mm. And so the definition of bridging the gap is making the difference between two things mm -hmm. smaller. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the things that we definitely have to do is bridging, bridging the gap. is making good. the difference between the different things that are happening mm -hmm. smaller um, in our society, um, in our nation, and even in our heart. We need to bridge the gap with God <laughs> and make the difference between what God wants and us want that and what we want smaller. smaller. Mm -hmm. There should not be a big gap. No, there shouldn't. It should be what he wants. Yes. Um, so um, I'm so glad that you joined me. Um, you'll definitely be back on um, Candid Conversations yes. with Coach D. Um, but before we leave... Oh, boy. We have a couple of fun, quick questions. Mm -hmm. You have five seconds to answer these questions. Think quick on your toes. You are a physicist, right? Mm -hmm. If anybody doesn't know, so my husband, he said when he was in college, he, his major was chemistry physics, right? He would go to class sometimes and sometimes he wouldn't. But he said he could go to class, listen in class, and then come and take the test and ace it with like an A or a B. Who does that? Mm -hmm. I don't know how he could do that because I can't. Um, and so if anybody knows my husband, my daughter, if my daughter Kiana's on here, she knows his mind is always going, he, he's always thinking. So sometimes he has to slow his thoughts down because mm -hmm. he thinks too fast I sometimes. Agree. Um, and so that's one of the things that I pray about for him is that God will slow his mind down so he can get the things that he needs to get out. But I need you to think quick on your toes. Okay. You got five seconds. Favorite color. Purple. Your favorite color is purple. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I'm an omega. Because he is on Omega, that's why his favorite color is purple. Because Jesus, the royal Jesus, purple. royalty. Okay. All right. Real quick. Favorite food? The, that's not fair. <laughs> food. food. If you're no. cooking it, it's my... Right now, my favorite is coconut cake. Oh, my gosh. Coconut cake? Really? Um, Lamb chops. Okay. So, your favorite food is lamb chops right now. Mm-hmm. You just said coconut cake. Both. Both. Can I have both? No, you can't have both. Um, favorite food. Hey, that's not fair. Um, he don't know y'all. Whatever you cook, it is my favorite. I like it. Good answer, huh? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, let's see. One word to describe you. Come on, physicist. Driven. Driven. I would definitely say that driven or I would have said passionate because boy, oh boy, when he's passionate about something, you think he yelling and you think he I'm mad. Yelling. Okay. Oh, Chinesa said uh, candy is your favorite food. <laughs> that is true, Chinesa. Candy is his Trying favorite. Trying to change that. Okay. Um, let's see. Who is your, fam your favorite famous person? My favorite famous person? I don't know. Oh my gosh. Don't really? I don't really have one famous favorite person. Okay. Okay. Well, when you were growing up, who was like a famous person that you looked up to? Seriously? Yes. Rusty Russell. Rusty Russell? Mm-hmm. Why? Uh, Rusty Russell and my cousin Pee Wee. Okay. Because he was a giant. And Rusty Russell played football for the Gamecocks and the Eagles. He was my cousin. Mm -hmm. And I was little, and my Aunt Rosalind would take me. I was like five. She would take me to the games, to the Gamecock games. And he was always, like, my big cousin that was famous. Okay. Another question. Who is your favorite female actress? <laughs> That's not there. <laughs> what? Go ahead. Seriously? Yeah. Um... It's that lady that look ugly when she cry. <laughs> um, uh, can't uh, nobody cry ugly like her. Uh, what's the what's the lady name from? Um, yes. How do we? How do you get away with murder? Th that one, and she also was in the Denzel movie. Right. And she was also um in the movie with Will Smith. Okay. The action movie. Y'all know who we talking about? I it's a, whatever her name is. She when she cry. 
That's your favorite female actress? Yes, to see her, because I've seen her right. all, all across a bunch of different movies. Okay. And she is amazing in every, every role. Movie, yes. She changes. She can be a bum on the street, to a gangster mom, to a... And she rock it. Yeah, and how she pulls it off, I'm like... She who's, your, who's your favorite male actress? Actor. Um... Kung Fu movies. No, yes. Kung Fu movies. Viola movie. Davis, that's right. Okay. Viola Davis. Uh, my favorite male actor is who I like to watch the most. Yes. Uh, Samuel Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson, y'all. Because <laughs> he's a fool. Uh, he he going <laughs> listen. He gonna tell you what it is. That's what So it if is. you guys don't know, he likes Kung Fu movies mm -hmm. and he likes what's those things, those com that stuff you be what he likes uh cartoon what's what you Dragon mean? Ball Z? He likes Dragon Ball Z, y'all. Yeah, I'm Goku. I'm Goku, Brits go um Darren's go on and um Brits go ten. Okay. I so love Dragon Ball Z. He likes Dragon Ball Z. He likes Kung Fu movies. And if I come in there and I'm trying to talk to him while oh, he's oh, I'm like I'm like, I'm what why are you what? It's just a Kung Fu movie. It is the Kung Fu movie. Okay. Favorite football team? Cowboys. Is Cowboys. I know that. Um what about basketball? Where LeBron is. He just likes wherever LeBron is. Okay. So I'm a Laker now. Okay. So before we leave, just give everybody what are your, um, what would you leave everybody with a lasting thing? Um, and just tell us where you see yourself going. What, you know, kind of some things that you want to see happen. My lasting thing is you have to do what you say you have to do what you see the need to be. Okay. Like, as God's people, we Christ was sent to fill a need. Okay. Sin. The remission. So be the change. So I would say, be who you say we're supposed to be. Okay. Period. And don't have any boundaries. No boundaries. Because God places us wherever he needs us. Right. To save whoever he's calling to him. To mm. be the example. Okay. So be willing to go wherever God sends you. Right. So I thank y'all so much for joining me. What about what I want to be when I grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? Now, if you didn't work here in the beginning, we already talked about when he was smaller, he used to uh, uh, make wars and all kinds of terrains and stuff with paper soldiers, paper horses, and kick his mom and dad and them out of the room. Oh, yes. They because go. they would be coming in. I'm running a campaign. We fighting over here. Okay. Over here. So he... I mean, we know from a little boy that he wanted to be a soldier and he became a mm -hmm. soldier. Um, so you talking about what you want to be when you grow up. You became a soldier. So we this was the roles and the realities, okay? So we talked about him being a soldier, a husband, a father, a pastor, and a politician. And we just thank you for coming on and sharing your leadership, um, sharing with us some nuggets. Um, sorry about the rocky beginning. That's something to say at the end. Yes. Can I see some of this? Yes. So, I'm going to go as far as God allows me to go in this political field and arena. I don't have any limits. If he opens the door and allows us to go through it, we're going to go. But at the end of my life, I want to open a place called Friendship University. Yes. And it is an all-boys school um, that focuses on not just academics, but it focuses on vocation, arts, business, and athletics. And yes. it takes kids from 7th grade, 6th grade all the way through high school and it takes those guys and transitions them into college or helps them do that bridge program to give them a vocation. Right. And so at the end, when I'm old and gray, I'd like to find some of my fraternity brothers and some educators to start this all male. Like I had a vision of wearing like Will Smith, those jackets on certain days um, on just amazing like, i've seen it my wife's helped write it so like, here's the thing you know it crazy. says write your vision make it plain so if, if you don't know i just finished my master's degree well a couple of semesters ago my um one of my things uh, a project was that i needed to come up with um a project and so i asked my husband i was like babe isn't there some kind of school that you wanted to ha open well he had never written the vision and made it plain well, this project allowed him to do that. So he had to help me write this paper and tell me what it is that he wanted to do, talking about budgets, talking about statistics and everything. So the plan is already written, mm -hmm. um, and I got an A on it. Um, so I thank you for and that. And what the teacher said about the paper? Said it was really good. Yes. Are they going to use it or something? That wasn't something else. Okay. Somebody use my stuff. <laughs> anyway, um, I also wanted to tell you guys, my book...
My first book, Motivational Wordplay, is here. Woo! You can go on Amazon and type my name in, Demetria Davis, and you will see my book is on Amazon. Type in Demetria Davis. Or you can go to anywhere on my page and you can go to my bit.ly link, which is B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash wordplay 2020, I think. I'm not sure, but you can go to my page. My book signing will be next Saturday, June 27th at um, WIDU on um, the Murchison Road from 11 to 2 o'clock. I will be there signing books, taking pictures. If you order the book, the books will be here Monday, and I will be signing your books, and I will be mailing those books to you. Thank you to everybody. I've had over 60 to 70 people buy books, so thank you so much. This is just the first book. My next book will be coming out in September. So please be on the lookout. My husband is a contributor in the book. And mine's um, coming out soon. And it's his is coming out soon. Keep I got wordplay him. going on too. Command your life wordplay. Y'all, keep on him because we need those nuggets. We need those nuggets. So thank you guys all for um, coming on and joining Candid Conversations with Coach D. We will be back. If it's not Candid Conversations with Coach D, it is Cooking with Coach D. Be on the lookout on my Parallel Fitness page, on my Demetria Davis page. Go to my husband's page. See the things that he's, different things he's doing. Um, he is going to Washington D.C. on this Sunday, on this Saturday. Him and a young man who is an activist here in the community, King Jones, they will be going to Washington D.C. to take part in a march. King Jones will be speaking at the Thomas Jefferson Memorial. My husband will be going with him. They will have a great time. They will be representing North Carolina here, Fayetteville, North Carolina. So we are thankful to him that even though it will mm -hmm. be Father's Day, he will be with someone else. And they will be doing something amazing for the community and proud for you the came, people. Man. Yes, we are proud of you, Keem. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Um, reach the people that you need to reach. And everybody on here, reach the people. Be who you're supposed to be. Be called to who you're supposed to be called to. Don't worry about who other people are called to, but who has God called you to? God gives us all different sets of keys, different strategies, and he gives us those keys and strategies for the people Damn that we are called to. Kingdom. Um, and so we can't worry about what everyone else is doing, but worry about who we are called to. So again, thank you, um, husband, father, Pastor Chris, city councilman for coming on Candid Conversations with Coach D. And you will be back to talk to us soon. Um, we'll have another show talking about um, leadership because that's mm -hmm. amazing. You do that well. So again, thank you everybody for joining. And we will see you soon on Candid Conversations with Coach D. Remember, it's not just a workout. It is your life.